thank you very much, Eile. I feel extremely emotionally, you know, uh, taken by what you said. So thank you very much. You, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> thank you all for coming. And uh, as Eile said, uh, this is a presentation on uh, my upcoming book. So hopefully that, uh, I mean. Uh, your uh, uh, comments are welcome, but it's already <laughs> under press in production, so maybe for future <laughs> research I will uh, take into advantage what you are sharing with me uh, today. So today, more than a decade after uh, several revolutionary mo movements shook the, uh, the Arab world, dictatorships have not been eliminated, nor have democracies established. Yet these uprisings, or as Alain Badiou called them, uh, called them uh, historical riots, have nevertheless exposed the injustice that people uh, endured under repressive regimes. They have raised awareness about the power of collective action, showing what a society founded on democracy, personal freedom, and social justice might look like. A manifestation of the multitude was occurring through the Arab uprisings in an attempt to create an alternative to the biopolitical production of the nation or the empire, a term used by Michael Hart and Antonio Negri. In the realm of art, a vast uh, spectrum of artists came out from cartoons depicting police brutality to graffiti uh, displaying the demands of the multitudes, to photography illustrating the wave of demonstration that have erupted, to literature reflecting the sort of heterotopia that the people were facing, to the emergence and flourishing of new literary and artistic expression, expressions such as autofictional blogs or music street festivals. This multitude of artworks have reached global significant and power networks, establishing a new geography, and I use the term uh, that uh, ne Antonio Negri also uh, coined, that goes beyond the division of national boundaries. Perpetual confrontations with oppressive governments in the Middle East and North Africa as well as the prevalence of some patriarchal values that still exist in the Arab societies have prompted women to find alternative means to cope with social, political, and national disenchantment. To this end, they have developed innovative artistic models and approaches, not only to express themselves, but ultimately to mobilize knowledge and creativity as social tools to inform and shape institutions, politics, and cultures. It is clear that the collective consciousness of these women artists, as well as their place and role in society, has evolved into a common habitus, which continues to nourish revolutionary movements worldwide. This is the core topic of my upcoming book, which will be released in February 23, and entitled Arab Women's Revolutionary Art Between Singularities and Multitudes. And which, and which more specifically shows how women's participation within the uprisings through art challenges commonly held and outdated perceptions that still persist in the Arab world and beyond of women who need protection and to, to be saved from Arab men, thus moving beyond colonial orientalist uh, rhetoric and images as Leila Ahmed and Suha Sabag and also Leila Abu Lohud has uh, framed it. Within the uprisings, the dynamics of this dilemma were uh, quite complex and sometimes inconsistent. While the revolutionary rhetoric praises women's agency, the post-revolutionary discourse often uh, instrumentalized women as icons of uh, national identity, asking them to preserve their ascribed gender roles and compelling them to play specific parts uh, within the nation. This is especially due to the intricate relationship between women's rights and national and political struggles. As uh, Nadja Ali uh, explains, explains. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Feminist projects uh, in anti-colonial struggles have often been sacrificed to, to the cause of national liberation, and in the aftermath of independence, women have been relegated to their former domestic uh, roles. However, there were points uh, of convergence between nationalist and feminist struggles, especially when the nation was envisioned as modern." End of quote. Since the beginning of the Arab uprisings, gender-sensitive coverage of the revolution through media and art, and even laws and constitutional articles, has taken uh, on a paradoxical element. Uh, Paul Amar has pointed uh, out how media coverage uh, presented uh, two contradictory representations. One was that Tahrir Square uh, represented a utopian space that forged a new gendered social contract. In a second set of representation, wholly uh, uh, inco incompatible uh, with those above, Tahrir served as a marsh pit uh, for a hyper-masculine mob where orientalist tropes of the Arab street were bottled up and concentrated, a space constantly bursting with uh, predatory uh, sexuality and not disciplined enough to articulate either co coherent leadership or policy. While women, end of quote, while women have been marginalized in many public realms, images of fearless women present in the protest were abundant and unconventional. This is why I show in this book how women have become powerful subjects, especially in revolutionary times, when ideas about the authentic women uh, are vital, thus restoring women's voices against colonial othering of others. And here, of course, I use a Spivak uh, uh, definition. The overarching uh, uh, objective ignited in this uh, study is as follows. If the Arab uprisings uh, did not bring about substantive socio-political uh, change, they nevertheless created an environment that is increasingly favorable uh, to women's participation in collective action and the public sphere. Progress in women's rights has been limited in the Middle East, with the possible excep exception of Tunisia, where constitutional reforms mandated gender parity in most of legislative uh, bodies as Arfawi, Mugaddam, and Zaki uh, has uh, pointed out. And yet, women still have a long way to go. The Arab uprisings were just the beginning. In the spring of 2011, thousands of women were uh, on the front lines uh, of the movements in MENA that toppled leaders in Tunisia and Egypt. These women played a Catholic role in the protest, organizing them, informing the international media, and nursing the injured. They joined the crowds en masse for long days during the public protest. They sang and danced in the streets and climbed ladders to paint graffiti and write thought-provoking narratives. Others engaged in artistic expression to resist oppression and to question the monolithic and conformist leaders in power. These women used art as a medium to expose and condemn human rights violations. <coughs> in the region. Uh, this culture of dissent, as uh, Charles uh, Tripp uh, described it, strove for meaningful change and the different forms of revolution promoted action and knowledge production, political and social consciousness. In other words, the revolutions in tandem with political demands also caused the, up, uh, the upsurge of a multitude of cultural and artistic manifestations that were disseminated in public spaces, on paper, and most importantly, on the internet and through social media for their widespread circulation. The more vicious and inflexible the regime, the more abundant the responses were. were. The primary aim of this book is to examine the intimate synergy between creative thought and dissent action. It looks closely at the past and present roles that culture and art play in producing social transformation. The aim is to also provoke some critical attention to innovative expressions encompassing multiple artistic forms and genres such as graffiti, street performances, photography, phototext, novels and comics. The book focuses on several specific women artists, while also documenting a large number of others. 
The artists include Egyptians such as graffiti artist and art historian Bahia Shihab, street performances by Rania Refat, puppet theater, the revolutionary story told by the feminist group El Battle Aswad, the, uh, the, uh, the Odd Ducks, or the old performer uh, Yasmin El Baramawi, Tunisian photographer Hela, Hela Ammar, writer and academic uh, Dora uh, Latiri, Moroccan activist and comic strip illustrator Zena Fasiki, and French Algerian writer Kausar Adimi. The juxtaposition of artwork from different localities and different languages, Arabic and French as well, uh, aims to offer alternative voices and vision uh, within a transnational multilingual perspective, reflecting on what these works have in common, but more importantly, what distinguished them. Uh, what Arjun Apadurai recognizes as relations of disjuncture, end of quote. The important questions in this uh, book include what is the role of art in revolutionary ground? Uh, must art be overtly political in order to incite the public to act against all forms of oppression and injustice? Or uh, should it preserve its pure, purely aesthetic nature? And what is the impact of building solidarity networks underground uh, as, opposed to, uh, as opposed to in public? Other questions explored involve, uh, involved women specifically, which is the impact of these revolutions on women's creativity? How do women experience the revolution, or rather their revolution? How is their art different from before the revolution? How is it distinguished uh, from men's art? And uh, I mainly argue that thanks to uh, the Arab uprising, the world has witnessed what I'm calling in my book a parallel revolution, an underground interstitial artistic proliferation led by women unfolding via a rhizomatic machinery generated, generating what Deleuze and Guattari have duped strange new becomings, new polyvocalities, end of quote. What was taking place in the region is not only a political revolution, according to Walid al-Hamamsi and Munira uh, Suleiman, I quote them, it was also and equally forcefully a social and cultural revolution, end of quote. I also argue that this parallel revolution has developed ingenious approaches for mobilizing popular consciousness, constituting powerful stimulant for contesting existing dictatorial regimes, and demonstrating what Hamid Dabashi calls a delayed defiance. Through, I, I quote him again, a new imaginative geography of liberation in which ideas of freedom, social justice, and human dignity are brought forth to the collective imagination of the revolutionaries, an imagination already cultivated in literary and artistic forms, end of quote. In the book, I also show how this uh, new expression drew on an increased and more conscious use of social media, as well as new technologies, in order to reach a larger audience on the streets and through cyberspace and social media. This has facilitated the emergence of a new public sphere to which women have access physically, virtually, and also symbolically, fostering a more part participatory platform through which the public can engage not only in art, but also in the very process, process of its creation. A common consciousness between the artists and their audiences is thus, is thus established, preserving the revolutionary spirit and sharing the greatest possible collective, collective solidarity as well as an awareness of common goals locally and worldwide. By embracing local and Western uh, cultural commodities, I also contend that these women are necessarily shaped by a transnational stance that operates indirectly, allowing them to experience a new personal and social balance. In an attempt to reach greater audiences, both local and international, this offers a new terrain a local one, echoing what Susan Friedman uh, has defined as a geopolitical loc loc locational uh, feminism, which uh, I quote her, travels globally in its thinking, 
remaining attentive to the ways these differences are continually in the process of modification through interactions within a global system of diverse multi-directional exchanges." End of quote. While I showed that institutional, ideological, and economic forces have worked persistently to dismantle these power and powerful energies, uh, what also unites these artists is their conviction that the struggle is always in progress, though also recognizing the disruptive nature of revolution, as Hannah Arendt that clarifies that the modern concept of revolution is, I quote her, inextricably bound up with the notion that with the course of history suddenly begins anew, that an entirely new story, a story never known or told before, is about to unfold. End of quote. As a process of transformation, the revolution is still unfolding. Uh, the, uh, another section is about how I use the, what I call feminist activism. The Arab uprisings, which called uh, for freedom and justice, also promoted a new feminism, which, as Margot Badran explains, I quote her, does not go by the name feminism, but by its spirit redefines the words freedom, liberation, justice, dignity, democracy, equality, and rights, end of quote. While the artistic manifestation, uh, manifestations from women uh, that uh, interest me share common demands with men, they inevitably contain an additional layer inherent to women's causes and aspirations, which are all related to the struggle against the gender-based inequality they experience. They also uh, critique a transnational feminism that unifies Arab women's struggles within a single frame, which is of a Western perspective, as Badran, Mohanty, Edward Said had pointed out. The book examines how women's uh, creativity constitute a powerful tool of resistance against any form of oppression, whether related to a regime, to colonialism, to post-colonialism, and to patriarchy, as they are all interconnected. This is why the book engages with some force wave feminist, feminist concepts to highlight how they are intrinsically uh, linked to the socio-political turmoil, not only witnessed in the Arab region since 2011, but as a global movement around the world. Forced wave feminism has undeniably expanded our global and interdisciplinary perspective on feminism and feminist activism more broadly. While it addresses uh, both change and continuity, it claims, uh, are, uh, it, it, its claims are not entirely different from the former waves, which their focus on micropolitics and challenging sexism and misogyny. Within its framework, artistic expressions highlight a greater reliance on social media and new technologies to convey messages and promote actions. Forced wave feminism continues to rely on grassroots and street activism. On a global scale, uh, forced waivers tend to rely on performative uh, politics. They stage political or artistic performances to raise awareness and protest current issues. Moreover, uh, intersectionality is being employed by uh, forced wave feminists with the co its consideration of class, race, age, ability, sexuality, and gender in an effort to ensure that the global community and police makers in particular take into account the privileges and obstacles generated by their various social and geographical locations and view their situation in light of the global economic and socio-political context of contemporary society thus fostering a greater global so solidarity. I am also interested in demonstrating that the works uh, of art under scrutiny in this book highlight their aesthetic nature while also stressing their strong political significance, thus navigating the tensions between art and activism, politics and poetics, and transforming the relationship between art and politics. This interaction between art production and activism could be considered a form, or art, or a form of artivism when art is used as a form of protest and the words are turned into action. 
drawing on a vast array of artistic productions from different revolutionary periods and spaces and using an inter interdisciplinary approach, I present a cohesive analysis of the place and role of women in the Arab world by exploring the ways in which women creativity proposes alternative epistemologies and moreover archives, def archives defiance in radical and creative ways. The book is divided into three parts, visualizing the revolution, performing the revolution, and writing the revolution. In order to better grasp the relationship between the textual and the visual, as well as the choice of media. Each chapter of the book, which uh, opens with an ex exhaustive uh, overview of the most influential artists in each domain, then <coughs> I focus on one central act artist. Chapter one, Bahia Shehab, the invisible Cairo street artist. Within a few days, uh, the streets of Cairo became a public museum for graffiti art and a powerful catalyst for defiance. Many women artists were mobilized to take part of this flourishing medium, painting powerful political messages on the walls of Cairo and voicing their demands and, dra and dreams uh, for freedom, justice, and gender equality. Bahia Shihab, an artist, designer, and historian of Islamic art, was an engaged adherent to the, of the revolution, and her art was deeply uh, driven by her political and social commitments. Each of her displays was a response to specific abuses by the authorities and the governments acting with impunity. Through her various graffiti series uh, entitled A Thousand Times No, and Tamarrad Yaotta, meaning rebel cat, uh, among others, Shehab has skillfully uh, used her counter stories to diversify and orient her art uh, form towards a re reinterpretation of contemporary Arab politics, feminist discourses, and questions uh, related to social order. Her art feminized the act of rebel, of revolt, in reaction to the aggressive and organized sexual harassment campaigns used by the followers of the Muslim Brotherhood to intimidate and dissuade women from going to the protest in the square. Her powerful inscriptions also transformed cityscapes into communal spaces where ordinary people can engage in political debates, fostering a strong and positive sense of community. It was encouraging for Shihab uh, that the multitude was very engaged with her work and joined her to paint uh, at many of her murals. But while it was no longer safe to paint the walls of Cairo in Egypt, Bahia Shihab started painting in other cities in the world, uh, spreading her no uh, that were once targeted at specific events to Egypt to become international no's. <laughs> that refuse universal injustice, unjust, uh, unjust human conditions. No to discrimination. No, it's not that. No to discrimination, no to borders, no to racism, no to war, no to closed-minded, and so on and so forth. It was evident that the Arab uprisings compelled artists and writers to seek more transnational visibility and support in order to reclaim what Hamid Dabashi claimed as a cosmopolitan uh, wilderness, at once local and global. Chapter two uh, uh, on identity and memory in Hela, Hela Ammar's uh, photo embroidery. With the downfall of President Zainuddin uh, Ben Ali's regime in 2011, Tunisia artistic landscape has strived a very prolific form of artistic expression that flourished after the beginning of the Tunisian Revolution was photography. More specifically, as the Tunisian Revolution began, images allowed people to bear witness to what was happening while also creating and maintaining a visual archive that was essential after many de decades of, dicta of a dicta dictatorial regime that had distorted the nation's history and memory. Hela Ammar, a versatile and politically active visual artist, 
joined forces with other photographers to carry out a fascinating artistic undertaking. Since the start of the revolution, Ammar has relentlessly examined through her art notions such as identity, memory, and femininity, seeking to challenge the social, political, and religious taboos in Tunisian society in order to question the country's official history, which has been falsified and confiscated through uh, decades of dictatorship. Woven Archive is one of Amar's work. Uh, no, it's still this. <laughs> Woven Archives is one of Amar's works that stresses the archival nature of art. It is a set of photographs on which uh, read uh, this one on the, and this also uh, on which uh, uh, read um, satin stitches are literally intertwined on the image. Assembled together, the photographs form a constellation of personal and collective memories represented in embroidery and reflecting the long and complex narrative of Tunisian history. This is what Jacques Derrida called archive fever or malt archive. Oftentimes, it is impossible to find traces of the archives as they are relegated to oblivion or inaccessible after being concealed by the regime. Archive fever, therefore, arises as a very profound emotional need to document what has happened. Amar's red stitches create a unified chronotope, underscoring the intrinsic uh, correlation between temporal and sp spatial elements expressed in these inventive productions. This illustrates the continuity between past and present in, at in an attempt to link the fragments of uh, uh, shared and scattered memories and reconstruct a collective memory. Her last exhibit uh, launched uh, in 2018, A Fleur de Peau, uh, A Body Talks, is about, a personal it's about personal stories of ordinary and marginalized people reflecting the gender fluidity in defiance of gender taboos surrounding the body. This collection comprises of seven portraits of activists who are well known by the local and international media, including bloggers, journalists, and artists, and who advocate for individual freedoms and, poor, and more particularly for LGBTQ rights. The exposed uh, body st stresses is its materiality and contours, but also its limitations, as the bodies are depicted without being able to see. This, is, uh, this in turn reflects human vulnerability exposed in the public uh, sphere uh, to, all, uh, to all forms of violence, homophobia, racism, and sexism. During the Egyptian uprisings of 2011 and a couple of years beyond, women's body articulated some compelling discourses of dissent that encouraged the potential for, for transformation for women. In chapter three, uh, entitled When Women's Bodies Speak in the Public, I was interested in demonstrating how women's body perform in the streets as vehicles of resistance to social control. The Arab uprisings were quite saturated by iconic bodily performances, like the self-immolation of Mohammed Bouazizi in Tunisia, or Alia, Alia El Mahdi's posing nude in an artistic self-portrait, both provocative uh, while raising important social and political issues. Viewing the body as a political tool reflects um, notions of agency, representation, and dissent. Judith Butler's concept of collective performativity and the right of the people to claim the public sphere is very pertinent to my reflection. While these models of revolutionary creativity brought isolated artists together, a multitude of singularities were taking over the streets of Cairo, creating a sense of collective utopian space where ordinary people co could congregate uh, through what Asif Bayad calls non-movements. In chapter four, Comics Against Taboos in Morocco, 
I show how the comics renaissance prevailed with the Arab uprisings in the region and how artists, especially young ones, were galvanized by the events rocking their countries. As comic books are a relatively new genre in the Arab world, a new generation of artists emerged at the end of the 2000s, largely connected through social media and influenced by all the international trends. They became uh, more popular through publishing uh, digital versions or, of their work, making them more accessible than ever. With the Arab unrest, women began to enter the comics world. Zeynep Fasiki uh, uh, stands out as one of the pioneers, uh, uh, pioneering artists in Morocco who uses comics to denounce oppressive traditions and taboos in the Arab world and the control exerted over women's body. In 2019, Zeynep Fasiki published her book, Hushuma, Corps et Sexualité au Maroc, uh, Hushuma, Body and Sexuality in Morocco, at the crossroads of gender, race, ethnicity, and class, the book can be viewed as a space for educating, educating readers and developing awareness of intersectional identities while challenging the conventions of comics themselves. While Fasiki's uh, artwork celebrates uh, women's body regardless of their forms and ages, it also raises the status of minorities based on gender, language, or class. I maintain that this text can be considered a sort of creative disobedience, which is socially engaged in its, in its combination of literary ac activism with an overt political consciousness. Through her art, Fasiki thus seeks new ways to represent and celebrate the subjectivities of non-normative experiences surrounding the stereotypes and problematic attitudes towards women, minorities, and those with LGBTQIA plus identities. She was able to uh, destabilize the coherence of the subject by uh, self-reflexively exploring complex representations of gender and sexual identification in order to create a more inclusive society. In chapter five, uh, entitled Kausar Adimi's Palimpsest of Revolutionary History, I explore another revolutionary space in uh, the recent novel by Kausar Adimi, Les Petits de Décembre, or uh, Decem uh, the, the Small Kids of December, I don't know, <laughs> which recounts the Hirak, Algerian Revolution of uh, uh, 20, uh, 2019. Largely inspired by Tahrir Square, the novel explores contemporary Algerian society and political and military structures. More specifically, I show how the novel offers its readers alternative spaces for protest, such as the soccer field. Vlad is here? No. Okay. He's uh, coming up with a new book on soccer, which serves as a metaphor uh, for antagonism as a pre preeminent um, site where nation states come to be united and contested. More specifically, I demonstrate how Adimi's novel uh, resurrects Algeria's palimpsestic uh, history presenting a, a condensed version of the country's history since independence. It, it illustrates the struggles faced by Algeria and the uh, Arab world, recalling these crucial moments as superimposed over the narrow space of a soccer field, which becomes a powerful symbol uh, of resilience and potential change. I also show how in this revolutionary context, soccer becomes an egalitarian, uh, since we are talking about the World Cup, it becomes really very natural, <laughs> an egalitarian sometimes, and democratic platform, not the institution, but the, the soccer field, <laughs> egalitarian and democratic platform for the multitude. In a similar way to the sit-ins uh, in Tahrir Square, where men and women of all ages camped out. Clearly, the prominent role played by the children and young people in the novel mirrors the role played by the youth in the Arab Spring. 
They are powerful uh, new agents for political and social change, while also tackling the complex structure of the patriarchal family and the authoritarian state, while also questioning the hegemonic cultural discourses by the power of the multitude. In chapter six, revolutionary art in nomadic spaces, I contend that the Arab uh, revolutions inspired many men and women around the globe to rethink their relationship with their homelands and devise new roles to play from within their host countries. One of the major dilemmas that many of these citizens have faced until now is how to reconcile their multiple loyal, lo, 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 loyalties, national, cultural, and political, without jeopardizing their relative stability and sense of belonging in their host countries. Within the broad diasporic communities, a minority of du uh, dual nationals reside in the West, were involved in both struggling for freedom in their homeland and spreading awareness and encouraging mobilization in their host country. Within the Arab uprisings, Dora Latiri's journey as a Tunisian British professor, writer, and intellectual, as many other artists, shared a sense of double belonging. Simultaneously, in one place and another, reflecting what I called in my book a new, non, a new nomadic consciousness. A nomadic consciousness that can relentlessly renew the sentiment of deep attachment to the home country, combined with new feelings of pride and shared destiny. In 2013, Latiri uh, embarked in a creative project focusing more on photography with her first photo text entitled uh, uh, a Love of Tunisia, photo album of a return to my native land after the revolution. Latiri, uh, An Amour de Tunis, de Tunis uh, A Love of Tunisia, is a short uh, uh, narrative uh, which offers uh, a fascinating illustration of the relationship between the private and the public, art and life, in the way uh, it explores, it, it explores the idea of uprooting and exile. Each chapter of the book constitutes an idiosyncratic way of conceiving the people's power and desire for change, but when put together, the chapters are interconnected by the, this desire of the multitude based on the dynamic synergy that they constitute. The perpetuation of these singularities was indispensable in communicating horizontally with other ones. This multitude, therefore, not only persists power, but also seeks autonomy from it, empower the population, and allow them to create new social power relations, emphasizing their constant becoming. So in an attempt to present some closing remarks on a chronicle that is still unfolding, the artistic modes of expression assembled in the book underline the ways that art meaningfully reflect the socio-political scene and effectively uh, grapples with and resists the current harsh realities of repressive regimes. After decades of censorship and fear, revolution certainly brought about a cultural and artistic awakening and the ongoing violation of human rights within the current Arab regimes are being and will be defied by art, civic movement, and, pe and the people's will. While dictatorial regimes uh, fiercely control everyday public space, the people are showing resilience within their everyday struggle to survive their, I quote Asif Bayad, everyday revolution. If the revolution produced, as I said, modest uh, political, social, and economic gains for the citizens, it surely went beyond the political and paved a way for new cultural initiatives across the Arab world. The uprisings may have brought about, I quote Dabashi, who said, uh, the restoration of a confidence in being in the world, in the end of quote. Even if the future appears volatile and inherently uncertain, Artists continue to keep uh, their hope alive by producing forms of artistic impressions, ones that may hold the potential to secure rights and freedom for all. What is left is their hope. 
as Miriam Cook uh, stresses, I quote her, uh, they hope that their art, fiction, films, testimonials, and poetry might make a difference as, as they fashion a memory that will bear witness to the people's rejections of the corruption, cruelty, and criminality of the regime, end of quote. Thus, art as a complex, complex ongoing process is capable of preserving the revolutionary soul that sparked in 2011 uh, throughout the Arab world. And because transforming people's consciousness take time, long-term revolutionary practices and artistic expression will remain an effective way of resisting oppressive uh, daily life while building an ideal imagined community. For these artists and writers, the revolution is unfinished and therefore ongoing. Art will always be oriented toward an open future as a conditioning factor for social resistance and a, and a vehicle uh, to document what has happened and what stories will be told. Therefore, the revolution continues. Thank you. <laughs> No, this is the, the no, uh, it's a calligraphy, right. uh, it's an Arabic calligraphy. Uh, uh, she, have, uh, she, uh, she came up with this uh, huge project to come up with uh, 1,001 uh, ways of uh, writing the la, meaning no in Arabic. So she, I think she has now 850 <laughs> some uh, ways of uh, writing the la. So, 1001, and we have, a, <laughs> we have a say in Arabic when you want to, you know, how Arab, Arab people tend to exaggerate their emotions. So if you want to say no, you would say no and 1000 and, and one time no. <laughs> to your kid, for instance, or to your husband or wife, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, so she came up with uh, the no's, uh, and of course with each uh, display she would add you know, a message, no to violence, no to, to discrimination, no to borders, and so on and so forth. And she came here, by the way, in 2014. She spent one, uh, one, uh, uh, one week and she actually, um, she painted uh, a big no <laughs> yeah, with, uh, with uh, stu art uh, students for one week. Uh, it was a workshop uh, led uh, by uh, art history department. And uh, unfortunately, we, we still have the display, but we didn't find a wall uh, to put it on. Yeah, they still in their storage. So if you have a, a wall, <laughs> let us know. <laughs> Did any Berber women participate in these uprisings? Uh, yes, well, definitely, yeah. I mean, uh, since, uh, you know, the, the whole revolutions uh, everywhere in the Arab world were also, uh, you know, uh, concerned about uh, minorities, uh, rights, and all of that. So there has been a lot of uh, uh, Berber, uh, Berbers, you know, uh, or uh, Tamazig or Amazig people, of course, in this revolution. But at the same time, uh, Many, many, of course, women uh, didn't want to be, to, to be uh, you know, uh, uh, like seen as women participating in the, or Berbers, you know, they were all uh, considering themselves as citizens, you know, so I think that the synergy was more about, you know, the collective action uh, more than a genre or a minority you know, distinction between them. So, but definitely, yes, there was a lot of uh, Berber participation in the, throughout the different uh, countries and, of course, regions. 
Can I just add to that that, they, that in Morocco they gave then the, um, after the 2011 um, uprising in February, they gave then the right to the language in the constitution, to the Tamazir language. Mm -hmm. so that, and that was one outcome of the protests. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. And in Morocco, for instance, uh, there wasn't like uh, a very kind of uh, open, you know, uh, 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 protest or revolution in Morocco, and I think that uh, the king uh, uh, Mohammed V was really uh, uh, clever, and <laughs> in this sense, because he right away when he saw that all the Arab uh, uh, regions were uh, uh, dealing with the, their own protest, they he did actually a lot of reforms, you know. So he didn't want to; he, he wanted to spare, you know, the people's uh, this kind of uh, actions and revolts, and he did. Very, a lot of reforms in order to, of course, calm down the people who were starting to also be, uh, you know, uh, contaminated by <laughs> the other uh, protests in the Arab world. So you spoke, you began speaking a little bit at the end about how art is not, I mean, you said it's both, it both reflects what's happening socially and politically. It's a space of resistance, and then you said that it also keeps people's eyes on the future, and so it also does something else. Could you talk a bit more about what it does, you know, how art, the sort of autonomy that art has from social and political um, and economic practices, what what does it give us that those other things don't? Yeah. How is it not just a yeah, it's it's. I think it's uh, it's uh, it has an impact. Uh, I would say uh, from what I have seen, you know, throughout uh, <coughs> the more than ten years, <coughs> that art, generally speaking, has uh, like uh, <coughs> an underground, if I may say, impact. That is not direct. It's not with slogans. It's not with you know demands and you know uh, bands that ba ba banners that are held by people or or debates or discussions, but I think that it's, it, it had an impact to, uh, I, 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 I talk a lot about it in the book, uh, to uh, kind of uh, have an influence or uh, uh, have an impact on the mentalities themselves. So we can see that uh, a lot of, uh, for instance, you know, uh, women, but also men, they are, uh, I mean, becoming more, the, because they are becoming more politically engaged, uh, they are also uh, more um, uh, existentially, uh, I would say, uh, daring, you know, in their way of, uh, of, of living, of, of dealing with issues with uh, women, with women's body. So you, we can see that art has uh, 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 like a, 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 an indirect uh, way of influencing the mentalities, the consciousness, the, the people you know, dealing uh, with uh, um, uh, like uh, more overt uh, discussions on women's rights, women's, you know, um, being able to be more visible and more active in the public sphere. And I mean, there's a lot of data that can show that uh, uh, the impact of art can be also seen in the way, uh, you know, there's, I mean, uh, it's not uh, it's not new, but uh, there is a lot of uh, you know uh, research and data showing, for instance, that I mean it's not that I'm against veiling, but we see that uh, many, for instance, uh, women now uh, more and more they are uh, taking off their veils, for instance, or uh, you know uh, wanting to be more active in the public sphere or more daring, and we see a lot of uh, uh, like uh, manifestation of this kind of openness in a sense uh, that uh, I think it is because uh, there was specifically when dealing uh, about women, uh, they were uh, more daring in using, you know, different uh, artistic expressions to, uh, to, to convey, you know, their messages, but also to be more visible. And there's a lot, a lot of really, uh, you know, artistic manifestation that has been occurring in the Arab world and this really, uh, you know, proves that there's something, uh, uh, you know, uh, changing, in the, especially the mentalities, I would say, not on the ground, but really the way people deal with things and issues. Yes. 
I'm similarly interested in this question about I mean, in your understanding of art and the role it plays. And I have like a question within a question, but um, I'm curious about like so the for your first chapter for the graffiti art, is it the edifices of buildings that the graffiti is on, or is it on walls? Meaning, you know, the kinds of walls that you know, like many parts of the continent, block off people's residences or you know buildings or parking spaces and so on. And if it's the latter, if it's the the walls, you know, it seems like there's an interesting irony there that it's precisely those forms of oppression that provide the canvas that the art is then you know painted on. Um, and I'm wondering if you know if you could extend that to the other media somehow. You know, the idea that power itself is the condition of possibility for the creation of art, you know, and if that says something about, you know, art can respond, etc., but it's also produced by the system itself. And like I said, does that extend to the comics, to the literature, to the photography, etc.? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I think there is a back and forth between the individual practices and the institutional ones, because as as Bahia Shihab, as an example, for instance, you know, she has been uh, doing it really extremely individually. You know, she has been uh, hiding and going, sneaking at night and doing that really individually as, as, as a reaction, her own individual reaction. But of course, she's an art historian. She's a professor at AUC. She, she's also uh, part of an institution. And she has been... Uh, uh, since uh, I'm taking her as an example to show you yeah, this synergy between the two aspects that you are mentioning, uh, she's uh, since the revolution, and she said she uh, she she never dared, you know, to do a kind of political. Uh, well, every, art is always political, but this kind of overt political messages. So since then, she has been working uh, on many projects with uh, her uh, students at uh, the AUC on creating uh, 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 comics, like uh, strips, only comic strips, for instance, uh, that has a political message, very overt political message for uh, their uh, uh, final projects and so on. So she, she, as if she was using, you know, the institution to uh, like uh, 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 sneak, you know, uh, her uh, <coughs> political act activism uh, through the institution. And for instance, uh, when she was, you know, uh, uh, like uh, a painting on the walls at night and so on, invisibly at night uh, uh, on the walls of Egypt, she was also back and forth, you know, traveling uh, and, uh, and, and and invited to very prestigious, uh, uh, you know, exhibit uh, these uh, uh, venues and so on throughout the world to also uh, kind of uh, share her, uh, you know, artistic. Uh, 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 artistic production. So I think that uh, uh, some of them are able uh, to uh, have this kind of uh, relationship, uh, uh, not very overtly, but the relationship with the institution, because, uh, and some of them know until today, we know all that uh, Banksy, for instance, is still, you know, invisible and we don't know, and he was there and there and there, and then, oh, he was last night here, right? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. So I think that it's a, it's a combination between uh, being, uh, focusing on their own individuality, but also trying to, uh, work uh, within the institution but it of course again it's it's extremely uh, 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 you know uh, dangerous after all especially nowadays I mean in Egypt uh, all uh, I, yeah I didn't uh, of course since my book uh, is, is a positive book in a sense <laughs> but of course one can say that there's a, a, a huge sentiment of dystopia that is taking place now, uh, you know, uh, in terms of institutional um, uh, censorship and all of that. You know, there's a lot of uh, writers who have been in jail just because they wrote uh, even uh, the most uh, symbolic, dystopian, futuristic novels. But still, they saw, oh, you're talking about us, mm -hmm. so therefore put them in jail. So it is, uh, it's, it's very problematic to be an artist uh, these days, especially, I mean, in, uh, in Tunisia, for instance, Morocco, it's fine, but uh, like in Egypt nowadays, unfortunately, under the military regime, it's very, very dangerous to still uh, want to write or, you know, display uh, what, 
whatever you want, uh, regardless men and women, you know, they are treated, of course, equally in this sense. So, yeah, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. I need to go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, um, I mean, there's a long history of women's activism in Egypt and, the, and these other countries as well. And I'm wondering why has it, this, in this last decade or so, taken this more of these artistic forms, the, the resistance, and why now? Why why not earlier? I mean, some of these are new genre, but but what's changed? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I think that uh, I, I I conducted, uh, of course, uh, lots of interviews with the artists themselves, and I think that it's coming more uh, from the young generation. Uh, mainly the young generation that I see this uh, really, you know, um, mushrooming of, uh, of artistic uh, expressions. And this is because uh, it, it, for them it was um, some more, if you look at the young generation, for instance, they were very young when uh, the, the revolution started. In 2011, those, you know, young, young people were like in their 12, 13, 14 years old. So they said, that a lot of them actually uh, were repeating that, that uh, they didn't, they, they, they were, uh, you know, uh, like uh, taking part of the revolution. Sometimes they would go to uh, the demonstration, but they didn't really understood what was going on, especially on the political uh, level, because they were still young. And I think that because of that, uh, they, they, since very young age, they uh, try to find another uh, vehicle, another means, you know, to express themselves. And because they didn't want to, 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 to have like a very political kind of position, because they were young and also they didn't understand what's going on, I think that they had recourse to art as another means, you know, to express themselves. So that's why we see a lot of these manifestations more than before. And it's because I think that it's related also to the fact that they, they, it's coming from really a young generation who were not really aware of what was going on. But now when they were you know, growing up, they started to see uh, you know, music, bands. We have a lot of uh, everywhere in the Arab world now, like you know, a hard rock and very uh, metallic you know, uh, bands and so, something that we didn't have before. And even like uh, the what we call the street um, uh, festivals, musical maharaganet, for instance, this is something brand new. It's also uh, a way for them to take over the streets. I think, like for instance, uh, there's a, a, a new uh, trend which is called uh, like uh, popular music performances in the streets. It's called Musik al Maharaganat. It's coming from actually a very low class, for instance, in Egypt, but it's booming and high uh, uh, class also are listening to this music, even if it's not uh, musically uh, <laughs> uh, you know, like uh, 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 sophisticated or anything. But because it, it is uh, the way uh, for those people who uh, were part, for instance, of the demonstration in the streets, they are also uh, trying to um, use, again, the streets uh, to do the music, but in an artistic way, you know, in, uh, instead of doing the political uh, you know, a way of, uh, of, of, of expressing themselves. I think, yeah. Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Professor Naveen.